That's enough of, of pricing. Final piece of the jigsaw is, is, is cost. So having decided how much we might get out and how much it might be worth, we actually have to say, well, how much is it going to cost to get out? And effectively, we need to es es estimate both the, the capex, the capital expenditure. That's all our exploration costs if it's undiscovered. That's all the studies, all the seismic, all the drilling. The appraisal costs, if we have to actually appraise it, and we always, certainly always appraise. And then finally, the development costs. Once we've um, got it on stream, then there's ongoing operating costs, OPEX, as we call it. And that would be recurring costs, which are needed to keep that oil flowing. And the final piece of the cost, which maybe 30 years ago when I started out in the industry, we didn't pay a lot of attention to, but is then becoming much more important, and we'd never even dream of ignoring now, is that the abandonment costs. And you can see in, in the picture, that's a typical early North Sea development. Lots of infrastructure. At some point in time, the operator of that field is going to have to take all that infrastructure away and return it to its natural state. And that's not a trivial exercise, certainly some of these old fields. And I've worked on some of the North Sea fields which have got abandonment liabilities of six, seven hundred, eight hundred million pounds yet to be spent just to clean up the infrastructure. And finally, we need to know about the fiscal terms, as a slide I've used in the, in the previous presentation. We need to actually know what, what the contract, and all, all the petroleum contract's doing, all the fiscal terms, is, is deciding what, how we divide up the revenue between the stakeholders, the stakeholders in this case being the oil and gas companies and the government. So in a tax and royalty system, the state is effectively taking its, its share through royalty, which you could call a revenue type of tax, and through income or profits tax. Within production sharing, then the state takes its share in lots of different ways. It may take a royalty off the top. It will give the contractor its cost recovery, but it will take its share of the profits through the profit sharing. It may well even have a state oil company. It will participate directly in the operations. So to the, to the contractor, the state oil company might as well be the state. Effectively, it, its revenue is going to the state operating national oil company and not, not, into the, not to the international oil and gas company. And in many of the production sharing agreements, there's also an income tax and profits tax. And then there are finally small amounts of money that, that pass from the, from the companies to the governments in the form of bonus payments and training of social programs. Within this region, majority of the fiscal systems are production sharing, but they are to the Australian Thailand in particular, which is still tax and royalty. So you have to know that, because effectively the fiscal system defines the the rules, the, the way we're going to divide up the cake. If you imagine the revenue of, of a project to be a cake, then we have to divide that, that cake up between the stakeholders. So that's the fiscal terms. So the, the final product of that would be, here. here's a, a diagram like this, which shows you the revenue on an annual basis for a typical field. In fact, it's, it's similar to the, to the production profile I showed earlier. And you can see on there that the top of, of all the bars, that's the total gross revenue of the field. The orange slice is, in this particular little example, is, is the income tax payable. The, the blue at the top is the royalty. The green is the state's share of profit oil. Actually, the state's share of profit oil is always much bigger than the contractor's share of profit oil. So at the bottom, you've got the red, which is the cost oil, and the contractor's share of the profit oil after tax. What I'm not showing there, of course, is that if there's this national oil company, then part of the red and part of the purple also goes to the government through the national oil company. So the international oil company's share is even smaller than it looks on there. So that's, that's, that's the revenue. We have to go through that calculation to get to the company's effectively share of revenue from the, from, from the field. If we then plot the company's share of the revenue against its share of the costs, you end up with a, with a, with a chart that looks like that, which is revenue being the positive numbers, the, the capital costs and the operating costs as negative numbers. The capital costs generally speaking, obviously spent near the beginning of the project. They may go beyond the start of first production, but usually not very far beyond that. Whereas the operating costs, the, the small purple bars, will carry on until the end of the life of the field. If we subtract one from the other, we effectively get to the net cash flow. So we're almost at the stage where we can actually now start to value this project. So the net cash flow just shows you the balance of the positives and the negatives. So in the early years, the project is cash negative, 
have to be paying out much more than you receive. And from a certain point, the project goes cash positive. If you look at the cumulative lines, which is the red line and the green line, the red line is what I'll call the undiscounted, which is just the sum of the, of the blue bars. You see in a certain point there, and it's about six years into the project, the, the project reaches called payback. In other words, the revenue at that point has got to the point where it's actually covered and pay, paid for all the costs. So beyond that, now we're then getting to the point where revenue is exceeding costs, and that can build up, in this case, to over a billion dollars of positive um, net cash. Now what we do when, in the DCF um, methodology is we, we discount that. We, we obviously value money received in 2030 much less than money received or spent in 2015. So the green represents what's called our discounted cash flow, and that's been discounted by in this case, 10%, but that could be, in, uh, in real cases, the, what is called the, cost, the weighted average cost of capital for the company that's um, in, involved in the project. So when we quote an NPV 10, what we mean is it's, the cash flow has been discounted to 10% per year of 247. What we're saying is that that project generates $247 million in excess of what we achieved if we put the money in the bank and achieved 10% compound interest rate. So we must have an NPV 10 greater than zero Otherwise, we're not generating or creating any value. If the NPV 10 was negative, we're destroying value. We might as well have left the money in the bank effectively. Okay? So most NPVs, if we're going to quote them, are going to be positive. Obviously, the bigger the positive number, the more value we're creating. So that's the net cash flows and the discounted cash flows.